Welcome um, to this presentation on Fullbrain, an exciting new device that's using, that uses bone conduction simulation as well as a dynamic filter to improve your auditory quality and your vocal quality. Just a little bit about myself before we get going. Um, we, I am Maud LaRue. I have a, a clinical practice in Glen Mills, Pennsylvania in the U.S. And um, I've been doing the tomatoes work since 2003. And, and this exciting new additional full brain came to us last year. So um, I'm as excited as you to kind of learn more about as we continue this in our practice. Um, in terms of <clears throat> our facility here in Glen Mills, we basically are an occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy practice that practices all kinds of different media also in terms of working with children mostly, but also with adults. Um, in terms of getting into the nitty-gritty of what the four brain stands for, we want to talk a little bit about bone conduction. Um, and the, the four brain device that helps us to improve our attention to the sensory message. <clears throat> the ex what we experience in terms of conduction is two types of conduction that we're using in terms of listening. We're using bone and we're using air conduction. We're probably a little bit more familiar with air conduction than we are with bone conduction in a general sense. Um, and if you really want to experience bone conduction, uh, if you take your fingers and just plug your ears and speak, you can definitely experience bone conduction. Um, and if you really want to experience air conduction, record your voice on tape and listen to what it sounds like. And know that when we're speaking ourselves, we're using air and bone when we listen to ourselves. But we're only using air when we're listening to others. In terms of the active listening piece, we want to think about air and bone and the fact that air information enters the ear through the auditory canal. Um, and travels through the middle ear and then registers in the mechanisms of the inner ear, mainly the cochlea. The bone conduction piece emits that piece completely from the outside and the information comes from vibration through the bones and goes directly to the cochlea. A very important distinction, as you will see later. In terms of just the general active listening piece, this is our ear. A funky little device inside of our inner ear the outer side of the ear is our pinna, which then gets the information from the air and through vibrations in the air, really. Then it permeates through the canal to the tympanic membrane, goes through the middle ear where the three little optical bones are lying, and then as soon as it goes through the middle ear, which is generally an air cavity, then it goes into the inner ear and the cochlea. And at the cochlea is then where the sound is going to be registered to be sent to the brain for analysis. And what you're now having is with air conduction, that's the path. With bone conduction, think about the bone coming into the cochlea at the same time and even before air conduction actually hits the cochlea. <clears throat> it's very, uh, bone conduction is a very prevalent piece for listening to my own voice. Um, and that sounds maybe funky to all of you. <laughs> But what's really important to know is that we actually can hear ourselves before others hear us. And, but it's so fast. It is split second tiny. And that piece of self listening actually helps the fluency and the way that we direct and verbally express our speech to others. And we must remember that bone is not dead. It's, it's a living organism, half solid and half liquid. So the sound travels 10 times faster through bone than it travels through air, okay? And then the bone conduction affects the entire skeletal system, also having an effect on posture. Dr. Alfred Tomatis is one of the big gurus when it comes to sound therapy. In fact, is the father that originated all of the other sound therapies that we hear about today. He basically said and believed that the bone um, conduction in the mother's voice that the mother's way that the baby hears in the world comes through bone conduction mostly. Um, it's kind of a body-on-body -body connection, quite visceral, really, for the baby's experience. And it's really, the, it starts that first initial attempt of the baby to listen, that motivation to, to communicate, that motivation 
to listen to what's happening. It comes from that very first connection, and it really happens through bone. Um, and it precedes, actually, the need and the motivation of the child to actually think, which is very interesting in terms of communication. It really brings a different definition to the word even communicative intent um, uh, from, the, from the baby. So, which is so important that when um, the mom is holding the baby and while the baby's in the womb, talking and singing while you're holding them allows for the same body and body transmission of sound. Okay? In terms of the posture piece of bone conduction, okay, could have alluded to that before, the effects of the whole skeletal system. The posture issues relate to bone conduction, and you kind of have postural relating to bone and bone relating to posture, and it's like the chicken and the egg, but they both go together. Um, increased space. If there is increased space between the larynx and the spinal column, so the spinal column is right behind the larynx, if there's too much space between them, it's a decreased ability to detect the, the or to direct the vibrations in the right order. And that would affect the posture. Also, if you have poor head and neck alignment, the effect of the traveling of the bone conduction will, for optimum results won't be as, as optimal as we want it to be. And then also, if you have poor spinal alignment, it will decrease the strength of these vibrations. So, let it never be said that we can separate one function from the other in the brain. It's all related. And, uh, and it's basically speaking through the body, um, while we're also listening through air. Okay? So that's the bone conduction piece of which the forebrain is really using in a very big paramount kind of a way. And later when I talk about the audio vocal loop, then you can see kind of why this is so important for us. But let's just first kind of travel and talk about the dynamic filter that's also attached to the device. That is a really nifty little piece that I think is um, greatly helpful for us. So to get that better quality of the sensory information, we use the dynamic filter. It's also called gating. In many, many circles, gating is used and um, for different kind of a reason. And Tomatis was the first one to talk about this gate. Um, and this gate is based on the principle of a, a contrast that's perceived by the individual of two alternating channels. So the same voice information is being used of a different frequency and intensity level. And the switching of back and forth between these two channels, dependent on frequency and intensity, is then called gating. So at a certain point, a gate occurs and the information is moved to a different level. And when the gate occurs again, the information is moved to a different level. A very important piece in terms of neuroplasticity. So this is a slide that we will talk about. We will show you a little bit more after I've done this presentation. Um, so just kind of back to the gating system, the voice is going to be portrayed inside of the microphone into the forebrain device. As this voice is going to travel from the microphone directly to the ear, okay, you want to think about um, the intensity and the frequency of the actual voice is going to be changing the filter of what this child or this adult is hearing while they're listening on this device to their own voice. So as they sing through the voice or speak through the voice or talk through the voice or read through the, through the device, the frequencies utilized as well as the intensity of the voice will cause the dynamic filter to switch between the two channels. The first channel will favor the lower frequencies with a weaker intensity, so requiring a little bit less effort from the auditory muscle. The second channel will emphasize the higher frequencies with a stronger intensity and a state of increased muscular effort. Okay? So not only are we using bone to get that information in there, we also, through the use of your own voice, giving you the potential of activating and alert, alerting your brain yourself. It's this double alternation that mobilizes the two muscles of the ear while respecting the physiological functioning of the ear. 
So everything in this device works on what is already naturally there. We're just speeding up the process a little bit, providing stimulation in the moment of what's there while using the natural capacity of every person to sleep. Um, quite a phenomenal little piece. So why do we want to do this? We want to be able for the brain to change, to, to detect that change has occurred. That's so important. If we are exposed to the same stimuli all the time, the brain gets used to it and we can start thinking about something different while you're doing something at the same time because it becomes rote. As soon as you do that, the nervous system plateaus and is not activated and firing so that you could stimulate and alert the brain. So you want to be able to find a place where change can be detected. And these channels, flipping backwards and forwards, helps us to detect that change and the brain remains alerted the whole time that you're busy. Um, also, you want to update the auditory memory. Auditory memory is there for certain ways of listening before you start using the device. So this auditory memory is going to be staying the same based on your listening experiences. Now, if you change your listening experience, you're going to be able to activate the auditory memory to take in more information, to do it at a much more rapid speed and pace, and also to be able to analyze and have a better compilation of time in order to analyze the data correctly. Also, the prediction about the forthcoming message. You want to be able to think about, you know when you're singing a song and you're learning a new song the first time and you listen to the chorus and you kind of pick up the chorus, right? So when you have that, chorus, that, that piece coming, you start predicting the information. And that's a very important concept for auditory comprehension. Um, and that's part of this whole um, um, space and place of using data. And I've alluded to you before about activating plasticity. Neural plasticity research tells us that in order to change the brain, you need high frequency, high intensity work, and you need new and novel exposure to the brain. Um, which I think this device delivers beautifully in a very uncomplicated way. Um, so you, so basically you're going to be activating what the research already told us is, is a viable proposition for change. Um, and then the brain also is kind of intent to follow rules and to follow things that kind of looks like it's going to be the same and is associated with experiences in the past. So you don't want to get to that place. The dynamic filter stops you from those associations that will cause you to be co into rote and maintain your ability of the brain to, to have attention or to pay attention. So what's the goal? The goal is to trigger the awakening and attention mechanisms in the brain that are necessary for the accurate processing of the message. And the sound signal that reaches the ear will activate the nervous system and will allow the person to pay attention to this message. We are our own dynamic filters in our voice. We can keep our brain alive. I'm a trainer. I train sometimes days on end. And people often ask me, Maud, how do you keep training five, six days at a time? And really, when I'm training all day, my own voice keeps me alert. I'm always more tired in the morning when I start than in the evening when I'm done. Because my voice can recharge those, those channels, those places in my brain that need to be activated and stimulated to maintain my own process. So we want to be able to make that available to anybody else out there. Um, so you want to be able to pay attention to your voice and not ignore it and not ignore the force behind it. If you've ever heard somebody speak that's depressed, you will know that there is a quite a low volume and low tone of voice that really doesn't carry and doesn't do anything to help this person to feel better. And you've also been in a, in a company of somebody that talks all the time <laughs> and is absolutely intent on alerting their brain the whole time to say, stay busy, stay active. Okay, so what you want to do is make sure that in the gating process, we're helping the brain 
to process information from your own voice in a way that can alert, stimulate, and maintain uh, and sustain your attention. Okay? So, let's talk about the audio vocal loop. How can we work on the auditory system by using the voice? We've just alluded to some of that. Um, but we want to know, we also want to ex, uh, ex, shall I say, expand on the fact that there's more to it than this. And it is really a solid thing to work out that we're busy with when we're doing this work. Think about this. When a person decides to speak, the brain sends the message of your intention, right? You're not speaking yet. Your intention to the systems in the body that are responsible for voice production. So air from the lung reaches the larynx through the trachea and then starts vibrating. It, the vibration starts before you emit the sound. This vibration of the larynx is transmitted through to the spinal column which is right behind the lung. And then the inner ear, which is surrounded by bone and skull, picks up this vibration by bone conduction and sends it to the brain. So the first step, step in controlling the sound of your voice is this piece. It's before you even using air conduction, before you've admitted the sound to hear your own sound. The bone starts the process most direct and most fastest pace. So the, this sound that's now produced by the larynx is also projected to the resonators, which is your pharynx, your nasal cavity, your mouth, your lips, before leaving the mouth as sound. And once the sound is expressed, it then reaches the ear again through air conduction, which is then sent to the brain for translation. So it kind of makes sense, right, that the bone almost precedes the air. So there's just two levels of control. The bone information is faster, in fact, 10 times faster than air conduction, causing a natural delay between the air and bone information reaching the cortex. The bone conduction alerts the brain that a certain frequency range is coming in through air conduction. So bone paves the way for the air. Okay? So bone is much more body, much more skeletal, much more faster, vibration. It's used whether you have air conduction or not. Very dynamic process. And it prepares the brain that sound is coming in through air. Bone conduction, though, is more global in its effect, where air conduction is very specific. Every word you say, every morpheme you say, has got a very specific nuance, pitch, and tonal quality that air conduction picks up at a much better pace than bone conduction can do in a global one. And think about somebody that's deaf. When they speak, they try and access some bone to support them, and they... Mm, mm. They kind of have that sound to them as they try and use bone to give them some feedback because they can't hear through air conduction, right? It's a much more global, more muffled, more muted kind of a sound rather than the clarity that you get when you're using air conduction. In this device, you get to use both in a very dynamic way. So somebody that has got poor bone conduction could present like this in their voice. They could be nasal, could be like throaty sounds. Their voice could be hesitant, even monotonous. Poor articulation, being expressionless in the tonal quality. If they sing, the voice may sound strained. There's too much demand placed on the larynx, so it's kind of tightened up there. It's not nice and flexible, moldable. And then poor body posture, as we said before, will contribute to poor bone conduction. Dr. Tomatis identified no less than 11 ear-brain loops that control the different elements of the voice production. Pitch, 
volume, tone, timbre, rate, inflection. Typically, we produce about 13 phone names per second. It's a very sophisticated mechanism. Very. We don't even have to pay attention to it when we typically develop. The control of the voice through listening occurs at such a rapid speed that it's impossible to be aware of it while you're speaking. So important to work on listening first to control the voice, right? And you can only speak what you can hear. And again, you're going to be doing a dual process with the device. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a, a broad base of understanding of what is achieved with this little nifty device. Um, and there, there might be some questions about practical guidelines and frequently asked questions. And really just remember that using the device is so simple. It's easy, it's intuitive. Simply wear the headset, switch it on, and speak for a few minutes a day. That's as easy as it gets, right? You, these are different ideas that you can kind of think about. Um, reading aloud 10 to 15 minutes per day is really a good adult exercise, a high school, a middle school, a kid exercise, somebody that wants to improve reading in elementary school. Um, there's all kinds of, of, of um, benefit to be gaining from that. But you don't have to read. You could simply have it on and have a conversation with somebody and um, and kind of do that back and forth bit with somebody that's sitting there with you. Debate the question whether they are sure, why can't I eat gum in school? Um, or whatever the case may be, that the pros and cons of something. Um, and then little one, um, enjoys doing things like nursery rhymes, playing voice games, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, ooh, ooh, ah, ah. Whatever you want to do, you can play all kinds of voice games and kids love that game, especially those who cannot speak but they do want to hear the sound of their voice. Uh, making sounds back and forth. Speech therapists, it is multiply effective for so many things that you do in speech therapy. Such a uncomplicated way to enhance what you are already doing. Um, giving that listening feedback um, of the voice that you're trying to activate, that you're trying to get verbal expression from. Um, social pragmatics. Listening to my own inflection in my voice when I'm doing that, the, own, the tonal, tonal quality, the modality, uh, modulation of my voice. Okay, just so many speech goals that could be attracted to this device. Um, while you're doing the OT session as an occupational therapist, which I'm one myself, just using the physical activity, obstacle courses while you're wearing the device. Amazing what this kid gives feedback. You almost hear a different command in the voice. And then we're going to be doing this, and we're going to be doing that, and, and they almost love hearing themselves. Um, and it's and it's and you can see the posture perk up the moment that bone conduction hits. Singing, voice exercises, humming. Humming is an excellent exercise to do for voice quality and control. Rich and high frequency sound and very stimulating to the brain. Um, and you can do all kinds of different humming exercises, closed mouth, open mouth, um, and you can um, have different ranges for what you want to do. Um, just remember to always be aware of posture, even when you're using the device. Um, you will see, we've done some pre and post videos on some kids reading before and after. And um, one particular kid was reading right down there, and it was this nice distance between the reading and them, and then we put the device on, and they went right up front of them. And you would almost say, oh boy, I mean, they're bringing it closer. And I think the reason they brought it closer was the fact that they felt like it was so close now. Their voice was in their own ear, and you could absolutely hear how they were changing and adapting their voice with this new reading device, really. So um, very exciting to kind of see those things and to see it in the moment in the same session. Um, but so very important to you will see that even when you take like an OT, a kid to an obstacle course or something, you will see that as soon as you put on the bike, that they hold their head differently. 
They absolutely do, and it's almost already picking up some nice prawn extension there. Um, when seated, ensure that the feet is flat on the floor. When you're busy doing an active session, like an OT session, you know, you're doing what you're doing. Um, and the child is going to see grounding for themselves anyway. Um, when you're seated and doing reading, we just make sure that the feet is flat and grounded on the floor um, to give more of that stability. Some frequently asked questions that we get, they do not have to speak in words or sentences, right? I mean, they can do sounds, they can do rhythms, they can do all kinds of different things, as long as they're using their voice, okay? Hum, whatever you may be. You don't need to be verbal to use the device. Um, remember this, that with any difference in how I'm experienced life, especially when you're working with a system that's been insecure to begin with, that hasn't received information and processed it in a way to create safety and security, that now, as soon as you put change on it, there's going to be an adaption adaptation period. Some kids take to it immediately and just go with it. And they just love it from the beginning because finally I'm getting more feedback. Other kids, they're afraid that it's going to do something to them. They're afraid because of their past experiences. They've got associations that's not going to be um, easy for them to, to break from. So you really want to um, understand that there could be different ways and processes of adaptation. None of it is a reason to stop. As soon as the child feels the comfort of what that actually gives their system, because it is highly alerting and calming at the same time, so you're using bone, which is very calming to the body. Once they get that experience, they like it and they ask for it. But they got to get through that first adaptation phase. Um, and then it's not always easy for people to listen to their own voice. Um, you know, I've learned a lot from, from joining um, people like Valerie Drew on courses that she does on the voice itself and um, how people could react to simply experiencing their own voice through their own body for the first time. And it becomes a part of who I am and my own ego sample. And some people just don't do well with it in the beginning. They do very well with it in the end. But it is not always an easy place to take myself to be so close to to something that I'm experiencing when for most of my life I'm holding things at bay because I'm not ready to deal with it as my system is too insecure. So you might have that response as well. They may need a longer period of adaptation, but it's not a reason to stop, okay? It's actually the very reason to continue. Um, yes, you can use it if you're hard of hearing. Uh, we are activating bone conduction mostly, so it has a whole body impact, and you'll see the impact on the body. And it also can be used as a complementary tool to any listening program or auditory training, which is so awesome. There's so many different sound programs out there, and you're able to use this with any single one that you might be trying to get ready. <clears throat> So, all ages, early language development from the first sound to 99 years old, extremely alerting to the brain for all, for our, um, to I say, a more mature population. Um, to using it on your own, you can use it with therapists. In the room, you can use it by sending it home to the parent. The parents can purchase it themselves. I would prefer all my parents buy it themselves. I don't send mine home to them. Um, educators can use it in the classroom with, with multiple use for a device like this. I have extrapolated all, all kinds of benefits that can happen from using the device, but I don't want anybody to get the message that any device or program could be a cure for anything. Let's just be very clear about that. I think if we found a cure, we'd be very rich today for any of these things. But what we're looking at is we're looking at it as a tool to enhance what we're already doing, to help to support the increased processing of what we are already doing as a speech or an occupational therapist or an educator. So this tool is definitely found to be a profound effect in a very short space of time, but it's not seen to be 
the be all and the end all. <coughs> Sorry. You can use it with students and children with any kind of developmental delay, with any kind of a developmental diagnosis. ADHD, ADD, awesome for executive functioning, is going to be affecting the phonological loop for executive functioning with active working memory. So there's definitely that implication for that. And really today, executive functioning is such a buzzword in the U.S. today. Um, and it's something that OTs and speech have been working with since time began, really. Um, it's just a, a new buzzword out there, but we all have to execute our function. And there's a whole slew of them that um, that really help, is helped by, especially active working memory, is helped by the phonological process. Um, very much used with uh, with reading disorders. I have a reading disorder program that I have that I import from Australia, and I use it in the phase two of exercise part, the active part of the program, uh, with nice success there. Um, person who struggle to express themselves verbally, help them to hear themselves better, to be able to process the sound better, to be better prepared for the sound coming in. Um, person who struggle to express themselves emotionally, which is different from verbally. It both might look verbal, but the one is definitely a verbal situation where it goes about the oral motor structures and, and what I'm listening to and what I'm hearing. Um, and emotionally, it's just as soon as I have to kind of discuss how I feel about something or put myself out there or serve myself or um, uh, get away from my innate sense of wanting to be shy, um, those kind of expressions are also helped greatly by it. people who want to do public speaking people who want to do any kind of something in public, including using the voice for singing. Um, speech language disorders we spoke about, and then also postural motor planning and sequential difficulty. So, um, really, really um, pleased to have had this time with you today to be able to explain this to you. Um, it's a work that's very close to my heart. And I'm very, very excited for the little device. Anything that can be simpler to use in today's day and age. Um, while I'm not expecting for um, for life to be cured by it, I, I can have a little tool that I can easily give to a parent to use at home and easily get a therapist to include it in her session that is fairly um, undemanding in terms of skill. Um, and still yet does the little job that it needs to do. An awesome tool. I thank you for your attention today. Have great fun using the device.